Hi guys, welcome back and tonight we're going to have a quick chat with Kev. Uh, he's a good mate of mine and he's been into lots of things in the industry. So let's have a quick chat with Kev. Hello, I can hear Hello. you. See you. Have you seen me yet? I can, how are you doing? You alright? Yeah, good are you? Yeah, are you keeping cool in the car? <laughs> it is cooler in the car than it is uh, in the house, it's got to be sad. I'm sure. <laughs> it's baking. Ridiculous sort of day. Have you still got sun? Because we've got a big cloud over the top of our house. Mm, no, we've still got quite a bit of sun here at the moment as well. You look slightly Portuguese. Oh. <laughs> I can't. I, uh, I spent the morning washing the car and uh, I thought I'm going to get out early before the sun moved around. But it just didn't take as long as I needed it to. So uh, oh, it's absolutely sweltering. It's been a uh, a hot sort of day. It's just been so hot. It's ridiculous. It took me in. <laughs> I'm sitting here in my air conditioned shed. Well, you're always in the shed, but I didn't realise it was air conditioned. Or is it a fan? No, no, it's air conditioner. So, um, move it down, shall I? That'd be better. Where do you want to start then? Uh, I don't know. You're the you're the uh, question master. Well, okay, so wh wh where did you start into your life of being an ADI then? So my life as being an ADI started um, in 2007. Um, so I was 21 um, when I started. No, I wouldn't have been. I was 22 by... Mm, trying to remember ages now. So oh. I applied. <laughs> Say again. Oh. So... <laughs> I know it just seems so distant, but um, I, my life as an ADI started um, basically just before my 21st birthday. That was when I sent my application off to um, the, the DSA, um, which come back and they refused me um, and told me I hadn't been driving long enough. Um, so after some help from a guy up in Scotland, um, who I'm, I still keep in touch with now, he sort of took on my case and um, and went forward to the DSA um, to stipulate and, and sort of raise um, raise an issue that I, I should be able to start qualifying and that the restrictions that they'd um, included about being um, over 21 and having a licence for four years was applicable as an entry onto the register mm. as opposed to uh, somebody just wanting to start qualifying. So um, they didn't know their own rules, really? No, because then they they accepted me on. Um, and I think as a, as a way of a thank you to him, um, a short time after we received a letter for a check test, um, I'm sure it was just pure coincidence. Um, so that, that really started off my life as an ADI. Um, and then I went on to take, obviously, my part one um and part two and, and then part three um ultimately qualified in march 2008 um and now we 12 years later um it's uh it just like a dim and distant memory of my trips over to uh to hold to train and everything yeah. else and then prior to that it was sort of um work with the institute of advanced motorist as part of their group group movement mm -hmm. um which Again, seems a, a dim and distant memory now. Do you think that was helpful then, doing the IAM stuff? Uh, yeah, it definitely was. Um, it kept me, gave me something to um, keep working on um, in terms of my own driving ability. And then I went on to train as an observer and senior observer, um, which gave me sort of that insight into full license holders mm -hmm. um, and the training of those before I then went on towards and becoming an ADI, but also keeping my knowledge up to date um, and actively practicing it um, and then understanding the difference between different driving systems as well, mm -hmm. um, where you've got sort of roadcraft versus driving the essential skills. Yeah. Do you think one's better than the other? Or... Um, there's bits and pieces of both that I quite like. Um, mm -hmm. I can very much see the relevance um, for um, how the, the DVSA style of, of driving compared to roadcraft, I can see that some novice drivers would really struggle um, with roadcraft and, and the fast-paced decision-making 
um, and th this, their skills just aren't going to match up to where they need to be, it could put yeah. them in more risk than help them in some situations. Yeah. So what do you think you learned from the observer role? So from the observer role, initially, um, was really the watching the driver um, in, in hindsight. I probably didn't realise it at the time, but just getting the, um, the skill of actually watching a driver, you've got somebody there who can drive, so you haven't got to watch out on the road quite so much. You can literally watch their movement. Right. Um, and I think that was quite important when I then moved on towards training as, um, as an ADI. I already had that skill in place in in some way. Do you mean um, the way you watch them and what you're looking for? Or? Yes, exactly. So when you you're watching and watching how look, I don't know mirror checks and and things like that as much as you encouraging them into commentary, um, you sort of what being able to watch them and their use of the controls, right. um, in the same way that I would as an ADI, sort of watching pupils' feet, for example, or looking for eye movements and um, and things like that. So. Um, I think from an observer on, and also the delivery of what you're trying to get across, um, obviously quite a bit different because you have got some, you've got drivers that are bringing something to the table. They've got many, many years experience. And at that point, a, a, grand, a lot more experience than I did. Um, for sure, I, I was fresh out on the road. I was I was 18 when I did my own advanced driving test and, and progressed on to be an observer. Um, so I had to sort of sell it a little bit more, maybe than some of the more experienced observers that were out on there. But what about your um, your, your ADI training? How did you find that? Um, I really enjoyed ADI training. Um, it become almost like a little bit of cat and mouse in terms of watching watching the trainer do something, um, and it really did get to the point where you you. And a bit like now with, when you're with pupils, that you can see the little steps that are being laid um, ready for something to happen. You just know that they're going to try and straight line a roundabout or there's just so many subtle clues and you just become quicker at it. Um, I do remember on my part three test, um, I got mirrors and emergency stoppers, my phase one, and, and it was really the lesson mm. that I did not like. Um, if, if there was a lesson that I didn't want, mirrors and emergency stop was the one because I just felt that it didn't have the same, um, it didn't feel to me like it had the same structure as maybe the junctions lesson, for example. And yeah. I think it was on the second emergency stop that the examiner did, I was nearly strangled by my seatbelt. And <laughs> I just think back now, and I just, I remember wanting to nervously laugh at the time. Um, but it comes as such a shock. I've never known anybody break so hard in my life. Um, and I was just sort of there, like, hanging from this seatbelt and then expected to still deliver some sort of guidance to what had, what had happened when I couldn't actually quite make out. It was an old shit moment, on. really, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It was like, my God, what the hell just happened? Like, how hard do you want to break? Um, but later on in, in the part three... Um, to what, getting back towards the test centre and I remember him shifting into a, a lower gear and thinking no he won't bring the clutch up in that in that gear it, we're going a little bit quick for that gear <laughs> I, I, oh no he's, he, he, yeah he's brought the clutch up um, and you just recognise it now with so many pupils what noise did it make up. though <laughs> it's the jolt it's the jolt that gives it away <laughs> and, the, and then the, the revs rising up um, the examiner again phase one, phase two when he gives you the word picture and he gives you a name I don't remember what my pupil's name was for the second phase but it was exactly, the, I was calling him exactly the same as what was given on phase one, <laughs> he, was, he was going to be called the same regardless. I'm sure he's been called all sorts <laughs> He probably has, he probably has um, but um, he was actually a really likeable guy um, and gave some great feedback sort of when he came out and gave the result and, and this, that and the other as well. Mm. Um, and I do, I, on that phase one, I, I consciously remember thinking, I think I've balls this up. Um, but 
just on one of the very last emergency stops, there was a saving grace of a van wanting to come down the side of him. And I almost gave him the instruction that I was lacking on one of the earlier attempts about making sure this is why we don't check our mirrors before we stop, but we do need to do these full round checks. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the only bit that sort of saved me is the fact that this van decided to come hurtling down. I didn't realise it at the time, but as more and more experience kicked in, and then with um with also what obviously what he debriefed at the end, it's mm. uh, those moments are really special, aren't they? The, it's uh, I think one trainer calls them kashing moments. The, the moments that yeah. you talk about something or discuss something, and then something happens, and you're like, yes, that's amazing yeah. because it's exactly what I'm talking about. It was almost I do remember one of my training sessions, and we were doing a junctions lesson. And my pupil or the trainer um, was about to emerge to turn right. And we were talking about the observations, looking in the road. And there just happened to, again, be a pedestrian over there. Um, and it was something that my trainer used to sort of say that I was quite good at, is relating to what was actually outside the car as well. And I said, right, pedestrian over there. Now, this is why we need to look right, left, right. Because if you emerge, where are you going to end up when you're having to stop or... Mm. Um, just just really good moments um, and I do sort of remember key bits I don't know why but bits from training bit from the part three test but also moments from my own learning to drive experience as well I remember um, as a 17 year old thinking my instructor had made up um, <laughs> the whole concept of blind spots and thinking I'm yeah. sure she's made that up what a load of <laughs> how can you be like hide a car that's just at the side of you. Um, and I remember coming in under, up, under an underpass, up to some traffic lights. I'd slowed down and I'd check the interior mirror and I'd seen the car behind start to move to the side. And so I, I, my eyes just went to the right hand mirror and he wasn't there. And because I'd slowed down and he'd slowed down, he actually stayed there for quite some time before he actually came to the side of me. And again, it was like, yeah, maybe maybe she didn't make up this whole idea of blind spots after all. Do you think people really understand blind spots? Because we, we still have, um, especially with some of the work that we do, we still have issues with people understanding them, actually, don't we? I think we do. Um, I think that the other th thing that seems to, um, people seem to forget is the stuff that they have seen as well, and then they lose it. Um, yeah. whether they become so focused on um, one of the clients that I've been out and worked for quite a few times um, a number of their drivers seem to have an issue with a lamppost in the car park and this lamppost is now painted yellow um, it had loads of signage on it and then in the end the client just decided hey let's get rid of this lamppost before one of the vans removes it for us because um, it's a really common one isn't it lamppost yeah but the, the, the crazy thing was in that scenario, the drivers were making it so much hard work. They were, they were pulling up to a store's door forwards and then reversing back away from it. And that's when they were hitting the lamppost. But they had loads of room to actually reverse up to the doors, which would have made it so much easier for loading and unloading of the van. It's like, why? You've made it so much, so much more harder for you to get out of there. But you you're also people, giving yourself more manual handling work. Do you think people really think about that? Because it's one of the things I know that you probably see, same as I every day, that you see something and you go, why have you done it that way? Because I don't feel like they've really thought about it. Yeah. Um, and I see it with, with my learners as well. Um, they'll do things the way that their parents have done it. Um, and likewise, I've spoken to them um, and when we say, right, do you know where such and such is? Yes, I do. Right, if you want to make your way there, and it'll be somewhere that they've been to regularly within, like outside of the car, and literally they're following a bus route. And it's like, why have we gone this way? It's like completely out the around the houses. And it's like, well, this is the way that the bus goes. And it, it turns out it's the only way they do know. And... When you actually talk to them, they'll talk about friends and they're like, yeah, when we go to town and then we go to somewhere else, the friend almost needs to met the three quarters of the way home to pick up the bus route to then suss out how to get to the other destination. Yeah. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's just historically how things have done. And, and again, some of the other drivers that we take out, 
where they have almost shown the ropes by somebody else, they will, well, this is where we park and this is where we do this. And nobody at any point comes along and breaks that, that cycle. So, I don't know, years and generations down, people are still parking in the same daft place. Yeah. I've seen it recently and the road is a one-way street now, but people, the people still pull into it to deliver. It's now yeah. a one-way street and they probably haven't even realised it. Yeah. I remember going to, my, my parents used to live in Wolverhampton and um, mum was getting excited when we were driving around at one point. She went, oh, we used to live down here. Let me show you, let me show you. And she drove down the street and we went to turn right and I went, mum, you can't go that way. She went, yeah, I can. Yeah, it's, I can go this yeah. way. I'm like, you haven't read the sign, have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't, mother. And she'll swear by that you can. We've all said that to our mothers a few times, I'm sure. But my, I'll go out with my mum. She's like, oh, when did that open? Oh, when did that close? And I'm like, have you not been? When did you last come down here in the last 20 years? <laughs> it's been there for ages. I suppose it, it comes back to our observation or lack of. We, we don't usually rely on observation. It's usually memory, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's autopilot. Yeah, um, very much and, so. And, and where those conscious decisions are or are not made. Um, but yeah, I, that is exactly what people do. They just drive in the same what, manner that they always do. What's your view on coaching then? Because obviously that lends nicely to that, doesn't it? Um, I think there's definitely a time and place for coaching. Um, and I try and incorporate it into my lessons a lot more because um, if you if you identify what the problem is and they come up with their own solution they have now got ownership of that but also they thought it through um they know what that looks like it feels like um whereas they haven't got to try and see it from my perspective in any in any way it, it's all about them um so i quite like it and, and it doesn't um it doesn't phase me when i'm i'm sort of doing it there's times where they need to see it when I, in the way that I do it, um, mm. more so with the learners, so that they can they can get that visual image of what they're trying to achieve. But actually, they can then come up with their own thing um, as they go forward. But it can also make it very, very interesting as well in the things that they come out with and the way that they see the world when they are um, out on the roads and, and trying to do something. Yeah, a completely different perspective sometimes, isn't it? On uh, it sounds like from what you said that you use demonstration a lot. It's quite a powerful tool. I do use demonstration, but I also then try and um, put them in in a picture of where they might use it. Um, and um, and turning the road used to be one of my favourites because of just the way that manoeuvre can crop up. Um, and I would talk about sort of where might you be going, like you've passed your test, where might you be going? Um, mm. Do you know your way there? So how, how are you finding your way there? And they'll often then talk about sat navs and that sort of thing. Um, and, and come on to how sometimes on a sat nav, one road on the sat nav can look very, very close and it might just be a little entrance and then they end up t taking the wrong turn. Mm. And I think everyone, whether they've been a driver or a passenger, has got the experience of the sat nav shrieking, turn around when possible, and it's like, I'll be throwing you out the window in a moment. <laughs> um, because that inside starts to just bug you. And it's like, I want to turn around, but I cannot find anywhere at the moment. Shut turn up. around, turn around. You're yeah, distracting me, yeah. And it's just like, yeah, I, I know, give me a minute. Um and then I'll say to them, so you've, you've pulled into a side road, you're now running a little bit late. How are you feeling? How are you going yeah. to be feeling? What do you think you'll be feeling? Um, how's this going to affect you? You're going to do this manoeuvre. You know what the manoeuvre needs now, but how is that actually going to play out? Mm. And they're usually quite on the money when they'll turn around and say, I don't think I'll observe. Why yeah. don't you think you'll observe? Well, they've got to do the manoeuvre, but they could cut out the observations um, in terms of trying to save time. But um, but likewise, when you're out on the road, you see people in a bit of a flap. I, we was out walking one day and um, 
watched a woman reverse into one of the traffic cones in the middle of the road and you'd sort of think oh i've hit that i'm going to stop and no she'd clearly just not reversed enough that she could swing the front round so she just carried on taking this sod it. <laughs> it literally was a sodic moment <laughs> But then I'm sort of stood there because I'm outside the car thinking, I wonder if she realises that she's hit the cone. But then you think, no, she must have done. You feel the resistance of the, the car doesn't seem to want to go back anymore. Um, but again, a, a instinct takes over or the, or the lack of instinct mm. um, at times as well. Interesting. What's, <laughs> what's your thoughts on the new test then? That was my next question, really. Um. Again, the test is a test and, and to my mind, it's almost become just one of those formalities um, of somebody getting a licence. Um, I think whatever's on the test is, is on the test um, and this is what they'll be tested on. But ultimately, oh. what they're going to do after the test is going to be far more important. Um, I think what we've not done as instructors particularly well over the years He's been able to understand why some of the stuff has been there. It's like you could ask an instructor years ago, well, what what's the reverse corner all about? Well, I don't, well, I don't really know. And therefore, they, they wouldn't then pass that on to their pupils and you'd get pupils. Now, some other instructors would be like, so why would you do a reverse corner here? Well, I don't really know. I'm like, well, do you think you just go out on like a Sunday night and think, that's a lovely looking corner that we're going to have a little reverse round that. Um, and it's like, no, maybe you wouldn't. So when you've reversed into it, where are you going to go? Well, I can go either way. All right, so it could be a turning round manoeuvre. Where are we going to carry these skills from doing a reverse corner? Where, what else might you be doing where you've got to reverse between one thing and another thing? Well, it could a be a driveway. driveway. <laughs> a driveway. Yeah. Um, a bay park yeah. um, and I, th I think it's exactly the same at the moment with pull up on the right and reverse the way it's tested is very random because it, it it just doesn't make sense to just pull over reverse back move up so on lessons let's put the car there why are we reversing back from this car we're reversing back from the car because it makes it smaller. It improves our view of the road situation up the road. Right. Fine. So, yes, I I understand why stuff is in on the test at times, but I don't fully understand or it's not put across all the time or particularly well um, where these skills and where these things are going to come into practice. I fear that we might have a little visitor. A visitor. How old is the visitor? Four. Oh, okay. He's now at the front of the car randomly. Isn't he in bed yet? It's a bit. <laughs> no, he's too busy playing with dinosaurs. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. He's just wandering around the car randomly at the moment. You should tell him to wash it again. <laughs> well, he went out earlier. Um, otherwise, he would have been helping me. Um, I've got him pulling faces at the side of the of the car now. Um, but. This morning, they'd have been helping me as well. Um, helping, hindering. <laughs> well, as you know, I've only just uh, purchased my um, snow foam gun. And uh, now I know how to use it. Um, it's very good. <laughs> I can't believe you're so late at, to the uh, snow foam party. I'm very late to it. I've, I've always wanted one, but I've been saving up. What, what do you think to advanced tests generally? I know we, we talked about you being an observer, but do you think... A positive thing i think someone put on facebook or something today um do you think that uh, it's a good thing for adis to do an advanced test um yes i, I think it is um because if we look at standard checks or check tests whatever they wants to call them um today they only assess teaching ability um there's no way of actually looking to check that the the driving ability is still there and driving ability is ultimately what we should be using when we're teaching what would i have done in that situation 
Um, and if we're a bit out of practice or not quite there on the latest techniques, that sort of thing, then how do we still use that? Um, how do we apply that knowledge or take that knowledge to, uh, to where we want to go with it? Do you think there should be a test for driving ability, on, an ongoing <laughs> one, or for radio? <laughs> um, it wouldn't bother me if there was. But I can see it might not be very favourable to the majority. I think I think it's actually something that the DVSA have completely missed. Where is the ongoing development there? Mm. I think we've also I think we've got a wider problem though. If we look at uh, DVSA's um, things in, in on previous years sort of related to CPD and, and that sort of stuff. Um, we've got a, a problem within the industry um, when it comes to CPD and people's attitudes towards CPD. Um, we've almost got the same problem with instructors of what we complain about having with our new drivers. Mm -hmm. Passing your test is just the start. We get our green badge and suddenly nobody wants to do anything ever again. <laughs> but why? What's the reason for that, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. There's clearly a, a human nature side of it that just makes make, makes us see that as the end of the line. Mm. Um, and not, I don't know, do we not know how or where we can progress more? Or what, what we can do to progress further? Um, but we... Again, we, we expect it from other people um, for them to to do it. Because the list is huge, isn't it? Absolutely huge. Yeah. Licenses, yeah. you know, courses on coaching or, you know, loads and loads of different you things. Can, you, can you can bring so many things to CPD um, and some of them are not anywhere near related to driving. But people just don't see the... I don't know, see the relevance or don't want to invest in themselves. But um, I don't know. Is it is it what the industry attracts? Because certainly if you look at other other jobs and roles and industries, um, the people that go into those look to, I don't know, for, forward progress themselves on courses, training. Yeah. They, they look at organisations that are going to also invest in themselves. And us being self-employed, it's almost like, well, that's our money, so I don't really want to, to spend it on that. Do you think that's important then that people do that, do them type of things? What, what do you think? Because I know that you've done some stuff. What have you got out of that, or not? Um, I've got various stuff, and, and not all of it has cost. If we look at sort of energy saving trust with their um, fuel save training, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the electric vehicle training, um, I didn't. It, you don't pay for those courses. Um, and I gained a lot. I mean, I, I recognised a little bit of a rogue trainer um, in there. <laughs> um, but um, there's there's so much within that that I've come across. It was sort of seeing somebody somebody else deliver training, um, and being on the receiving end of that training um, in the car and out the car, but also. What are the latest techniques? What is the um, the technology behind how we can fuel save? The same with electric vehicles. Um, it also gave some great on the road experience um, and practical experiences of driving those cars. Um, so it can it can both develop your skills, but also just being on the receiving end and seeing something done differently to give you an idea of what you could do going forward. Um, there's also the networking side of it as well, particularly if it is instructor related, meeting okay. other trainers um, and getting to know other people and sharing ideas. When I went and did my fleet training badge, obviously um, I met Carl uh -huh. and, um, and Carl and myself have become good friends over sort of the five, five six years ago since we did that course. Uh -huh. um, had I have not been on it, I'd have I've no, I'd have never made a friend out of Carl. Uh -huh. um, but we bounce ideas off each other pretty much daily, um, and are yeah. in regular contact. Um, so you do you pick up sort of personal um, friendships, relationships, um, to and, and work relationships as well. 
yeah. um, that you can then take forward, but also the knowledge and the skills um, from the from the particular course that you're in. Mm. Do you think we are quite innovative as an industry? Because there is there are some innovations out there, aren't there? I think there are. Um, I think there's some very much stuck in their stuck in their ways sort of thing as well. Um, very reluctant to any sort of change. Um, I constantly am trying to look for new ideas or think, oh, I'll give that a try. Mm. Um, whereas you still get, oh, well, I tried that once. Yeah, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> um, well, it, it still won't work. Well, why won't it work? It was, it was 20 years ago when you tried it last. Yeah. Um, so people do get stuck in their ways in a particular way of doing something. Um, but I, I quite enjoy change anyway and trying out something new. Um, hell, we've moved on from um, sort of pen and paper and colour files to iPads and moving cars. Um, so stuff has moved on a lot further. Um, Did you find that stuff helpful then, the the sort of iPad, the more interactive stuff? Um, yes, I do, because you can build up the um, the situation that you've you've been through. Uh, you can use satellite images. Um, there's been times that I've had pupils that have come to me with theory problems and I've been able to go on Google Maps or Google Earth and pick out a street that I know has got a particular scenario down there and then provide oh. a little bit of commentary with that to, and context, uh, to help them out. Context, absolutely. Because they'll, they'll, the minute they'll look at it, they'll think, oh, yeah, I do recognise that. But when they're driving the car, they haven't got the time to absorb everything that it's telling them. Absolutely. Um, whereas on that image, they can do it straight away. Um, and the same on the iPad. You pull up an app, you can, you've got a bird's eye view which when you're approaching a particular situation and you're looking at it head on, you can, you're sort of like, well, I can't make head and the tail of what's going on. Mm -hmm. so it, it does, it gives a different context and a different viewpoint as well. Absolutely. Um, we can move on from sort of industry stuff for a minute if you want. So what about your, your car history then? What's your... Um... <laughs> so um, my car history... Um, I could go back to my, le my learning to drive car, my instructor's car. I started off with, um, I think it was like a salmon pink uh, Volks Vauxhall Corsa. <laughs> um, it stays with me that when you did an emergency stop, if you were particularly good with the emergency stop, the cover over the sunroof used to fling back. <laughs> um, and it used to go with such a clatter that like, it, made, it almost startled you, sort of like you really did think something had broken on the car um, that then changed to a Citroen C3 and that's what I um, went on to take my test in uh, that was when they were new um, and I'm not so sure Citroens have improved greatly since but mm -hmm. um, I do remember it used to cut out on lessons um, and my not just start stop not just start stop as in I remember joining a roundabout and it cutting out and it wasn't a stall I was getting on this roundabout and because it had just cut out it actually bump started itself as well yeah and uh, I remember it, my instructor sort of saying I'm gonna have to take this car back in and sort of at the end of the lesson like don't switch it off because if you switch it off it erases the memory that they're gonna then read to find out what the problem was and um, so they were sort of my two learning to drive cars when I passed uh, my first car was a 1995 Renault Clio. I love this car, and it was amazing. It had the CD player in, which was a bit... Um, it was a bit of an unknown for its age. Um, it had central locking, had front electric windows, um, and I did. I just remember going everywhere in this car. Um, and uh, there's certain songs that come on the radio now when it sort of takes me back to being in my little 1995 Renault Clio. Um, after I had that, embarrassingly, I changed to a, P a Kia Picanto. It was a 1.1, but it actually felt far more underpowered than the 1 litre for some reason. Um, it had a bit of a, a random gearbox issue. It was the first car I got dual controls in, but it had this really weird problem with the gearbox every so often, and I'm not very technical when it comes to the mechanics of a car, but they told me that something to do with the cones were spinning at wrong speed. 
it was almost like the clutch was slipping so it would rev but the car wasn't moving and then it would be bunny hopping um, <laughs> i thought it wasn't so, your tuition and it wasn't my tuition and it, it did it when i was driving but of course it never did it when you took it to the garage to get of a warranty not. job on it yeah um so that had to go and i traded it in and got my what i would class as my first proper tuition car um, which I kept for quite a few years, which was a uh, a blue Ford Fiesta. And again, I really loved this car. It was the three door. Um, so it's 2008. So it was sort of that boxy sort of shape where the three door version looked quite sporty. And um, I got the rear windows tinted because um, I was 22 um, and, and I had to have t tinted windows. Um, but it was the first car that had Bluetooth on as well. So again, it was quite an early thing. I was like, I don't think I'll use that. But actually, again, once you had it, it was, yeah, the next car is definitely going to have to have that. Well, come the time I come to change it, every car had that. Yeah. Um, but I really did used to love that car. And um, when I did eventually sell it, I can't remember what, uh, 2015. So probably seven, seven or eight year old. Um, oh. I think it was... It was around, had about a hundred thousand on it, and it was still on the original clutch and everything. But I, I again, I just love that car. And um, I went almost went back to my roots after that and had a, a Renault Clio, um, white, red wheels, bit of red trim on it, and um, loved that. Again, bit of a gearbox issue. It used to get stuck in first, and um, I remember my pupil. Um, joining one of the fast speed roundabouts here and going to change it. And literally you had to wrench it out first for it to go in. Of course it went into the garage. They couldn't find anything wrong, but ultimately it then become that they replaced the gearbox. They did that while I was on holiday and the, I don't know what's going on with the Renault dealers and stuff, but the one locally um, had shifted over to a new, a new company it went in and it was almost like they just didn't have the technical expertise that they needed. So I said, well, I'm going on holiday, keep the car for the two weeks that I'm away and then it's bound to be fixed by the time I come back. So comes back, right, full diary of work, um, picks the car up and, and all seems fine. They've replaced the gearbox and stuff. Maybe a day or two later, pupil goes to pull off at some traffic lights and the car stalls. They start it up, but the whole car is shaking. It's like, surely, there cannot be something else wrong with this car. Um, so I arranged for it to go back in. And um, again, we was going out for the day somewhere. So I said, right, you can have it for the day. We're going out for the day. Um, I'll pick it up later. And they phoned me up later in the morning. You, you can't pick the car up. Um, it's, it's not safe. Why wouldn't it be safe? And the gearbox mounting had snapped. Apparently it hadn't been fixed on properly. Um, <laughs> so the gearbox mounting had now snapped. Um, so that was again, another off the road experience. Um, so again, really liked the car, but the, the problems and the support that I had with that um, wasn't amazing. So it sort of put me off going back to, to Renault again. And then I started with Mini. So I moved over to a Mini, I got a five door hatch and i really like it um and now i've moved on to a countryman um because i wanted to well my lease came up on the mini hatch and i was thinking right i'm going to go in and uh, the lady that i go see is called rachel so i'm like rachel i really want a cooper sd and then she drops the bombshell they've stopped doing diesels in the in the hatchback so if i wanted diesel it's either a clubman or a countryman and they don't do the sd anymore who so made this decision to... i want to speak to if, them <laughs> if they it, it was literally that moment it was like I, I knew exactly what i was going in for and clearly she'd not preempted this this situation that i'd already got my, my mind set on this car so three hours later and 19 quotes i eventually left the mini garage um to decide which car i was then going to go for so i had a vast array from everything from a cooper s up to the countryman um in god knows what specifications and all sorts 
Um, and I went back to see Rachel about a month later and said, I've still not made a decision. So we were sat there doing pros and cons of which car was going to be my next tuition car um, until I eventually decided I was going to go for the Countryman um, in, the, in the Cooper D. Um, so I've got this car for another 18 months and then that, uh, that, that problem will rear its head again as to um, which car I go with. Um, at least I don't have to think about colours because I just default to blue. Um, blue is literally my favourite colour and as long as it's not a gross blue, um, I automatically pick blue. Um, but I was really tempted recently, uh, I went in for a service and they lent me a mini electric. And if I do teach auto at some time in the future, I would totally want that car. It's, it's very quick, isn't it? It's very quick, but just everything about it, it looks like a normal car. Why can't we just pick a car that has an electric motor in it instead of a petrol or a diesel engine? Yeah. Um, and the Mini um, the mini Electric looks like a normal Mini, but it's got an electric motor in. Um, you even plug it in in the same place that you would put the petrol pump, um, which is at the back of the car. So talk about encouraging somebody to reverse into a bay rather than go nose in. Um, I did really like that car. Um, I think it could bring out some bad habits, though. Like what? Like wheel spinning out of every junction? Well, not so much, no, not so much the <laughs> wheel spinning, but just when you go for an overtake, it almost, I don't know, you almost want to hold back just so that you can put your foot down to have that bit of acceleration and stuff to go past. Um, but it is such a fun car to drive. Um, just the way they've managed to incorporate everything about Mini into that car, the go-kart feel and, and everything about it um, is just it's just so much fun did you do any charging of it um i did a little bit of charging just at home um i didn't really go anywhere that's got any sort of charging points in it and i had the kids that day um so we went out for a drive to um a, a local ice cream place that's just a little bit out of town there's some few back roads and things like that so I didn't do any any real sort of charging. I just plugged it, hooked it up at home, and um, to give that a go. Um, but uh, but no, other than other than that, I didn't. Because although its range isn't that amazing, although it's probably enough for most people, the, the charging speeds are very quick on the mini. So yeah, they give. I know if you um, have the home point installed, you've got sort of two options. So you can oh. go with the. Um, I think it's like a BP charger, or you can go for a mini one, and the mini one is is a lot quicker. Um, the range on it, I think, was about 120 or 140 miles, which I don't think is completely unreasonable, and I could totally no. it's totally doable for me. Yeah, so possibly you, you might be going with an auto at some point. Yeah, if it was a little bit bigger, I could almost see us swapping the family car for it, um, but having put the car seats in it was like a mini workout um <laughs> putting the car seats in and then trying to put kids in and um, clambering in the back of a three-door mini was um was something else um but um it's 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 just going to be very hard to make that switch tuition wise as well to mm. sort of leave manual completely and go straight over to auto and um, you, you do need that crossover um i love driving manuals as well though do you I think, love the involvement. Do you, do you think we're going to lose it? Because we, I, I have a feeling that this might be the last cohort, the next few years, maybe the last group of people that learn in manual. Yeah, um, it's something that's crossed my mind, particularly sales of autos are overtaking the manuals. Um, so it's something that's crossed my mind that, yes, people are going to move over to autos. I think there will still be people that want manuals because they're going to be driving classic cars or that those sort of things. But I think you're also still going to have those people that are like, well, if you learn to drive in a manual, you can drive an auto. Um, and I think they'll stick around for a little bit as well. Oh. Um, but I, I do really enjoy driving a manual. I like the involvement, the forward planning, the fact that I haven't just got to stop or go when, with one pedal. Um, I've also got to do something else and that takes a little bit more involvement oh. um, but I do think and from a licensing point of view how they will deal with it I think it's um, France that now if you pass in a manual you, you just take uh, sorry pass in an auto 
you take lessons with an instructor in a manual and then you, you almost get that license upgrade. Um, yeah. But the norm is pretty much that you, you're in that auto. Um, but there's so many more cars now that you can only purchase automatic. You can't get them in a manual at all. Yeah. Yeah. So what about what about the dream road trip then? If you've got, um, you know, money, no objects and the kids are being looked after what will be the, the ultimate road trip and what vehicle? Where would you go and what vehicle would you have? <laughs> Do you know what, road trip-wise at the minute, I don't know if it's like just a bit of a, a strange midlife crisis moment. Not that I'm, I don't, don't feel I'm there yet. But <laughs> I, recently I've really taken a liking to looking at people that have got VW Transporters um, and those sort of mm. vans where everything's in the back of them. And I, I don't know if it's just the whole concept of lockdown and stuff as well. Is the just that ability to think right we'll stick some stuff in the back of this van we can drive wherever we want it doesn't matter if everywhere is shut we're going to be able to clamber in the back of that van and have our food our drink or whatever um and we, we were just out for a walk the other day and we saw one i was like oh he's left the door open can you see like what's in there and i can see some sort of thinking i ain't sleeping in no van <laughs> um, but it really appeals to me and I just sort of think I could just be quite spontaneous one month and think yeah I've got a few days off work I'm just going to drive somewhere is she a five star hotel to... lady five star hotel glamping and all home comforts because I'm also very minded to think let's take the kids in a tent and she's not not entertaining this at all the kids might love it <laughs> the kids will love it but Sam's there like no I will where do I plug my hair straighteners in? So you could always get a caravan. <laughs> yes, I could. Do I want to be that person, that like most hated person on the road? We did. Um, we went out to Norfolk on Monday, and going down the A17 behind either a caravan or a tractor. Um, nah. Just no. I just love the whole idea with the transporter of you just in it. And, and you're done. But, so where would you go? I assume not Norfolk. No, um, because if I go somewhere, I do quite like motorways. I like to feel that I'm getting somewhere, um, which sort of contravenes what my mum does nowadays, which is like, well, which way can I go? And she's there, like, going to East Midlands Airport. Do I take the motorway or do I take the A46? <laughs> and it's like it's an hour and three quarter drive and she's there like planning this A46 route with a stop and a picnic on the way I'd rather just get there and, and be done with this <laughs> um, so I'd much rather get on a motorway but I'd definitely I'd just head into Europe I think I'd, I'd just drive um, and see where I end up to be fair so you're at road trip in a transporter yes I reckon so where would yeah. be the first place you'd head, do you think, if there's a... Um, I don't know. I don't think I'd... <clears throat> if I was with, stuck within the UK, sort of Peak District, Lake District, any of those sort of areas appeal. Um, but then I'd sort of like to head out. I'm a bit of a, a city sort of person rather than a beach holiday. So I'd be there sort of wanting to sightsee and that sort of thing. So... I don't know, somewhere on the outskirts of Paris and then somewhere in a little French countryside. Um, you could then drop into Spain and do a bit more down there. So anything sort of that related, I think. So what about Dream Garage? So you've got a Volkswagen Transport, a kitted up to the hill, polished up. It's been absolutely polished. What else will be in the garage? <laughs> You'd have to have the sports car, wouldn't you? So, McLaren, Lamborghini, something like that in there. And then maybe something a little bit more on the luxury side. So, I don't know, you could almost have the Aston Martin, couldn't you, which could sit between the two on the luxury and the sport. Um, but then something along the lines of the Bentley or something in there as well. So, uh, Have you had much experience with those vehicles? Have you done much with them? Um, I've done not so much the Bentley. Um, I've done a bit in a Ferrari, um, Maserati, um, and those sort of cars. Um, but uh, we need to be in Germany, don't we? Yeah. 
yeah for, uh, for that sort of thing <laughs> um but then likewise you I'd, i think i'd want to get over into sort of somewhere like some of the scandinavian countries for some of the uh a bit of skid control and uh sort of real life experience from that as well i'd always fancied one of the um uh, ice driving days um, I mean, we, we've had quite a bit of experience on skid, haven't we? But um, yeah. I think it, it, it's different being on ice. Yeah, I think the reality of it, and I've actually have that little bit of danger and putting, rather than knowing that you're within the comforts and the confines of a, a safe space, um, yeah, for sure, it, it'd it appeal. Going back on training, sort of the four before training as well, that, um, done over at Donington, Hmm. and just sort of how some of that can mess with your head and where instinct can really take over that moment that you're coming over the crest of the um, the hill and you're looking down and you're going so slow that everything in you sort of says I need to push the clutch down and the last thing you really want to be doing is pushing that clutch down um, well you could <laughs> well you could <laughs> you end up at the bottom you very quickly the hill very very quickly <laughs> yeah. um, but just instinctively you'd just be so tempted to want to do that. Um, and likewise, the bump starting for when you, for the failed ascent mm. um, was another one. It's just like, what well, I want to intentionally store the car and I'm going to start it with my clutch up. Um, it just doesn't sit right. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's strange, isn't it? It's different techniques used in different bits of driving. Um, yeah. It's completely different approaches. Um, so, what, what about the future then of the industry? Where where do you see it? Uh, or road safety? Where, where are we heading? Because road safety figures have just been released, haven't they? And there's slight increase. But what's the? Yeah. No. I don't. <laughs> if we're going to make a massive difference from now, I don't think it's going to be particularly supported by the public I, I sort of think that some of the stuff that they may need to bring in if they're going to really make any any big big deals um are going to be something along the lines of graduated licensing or compulsory further training um they just seem very shy on one front to sort of do things but then not so much on other stuff and i'm not so sure it's particularly targeting the problem Mm. What what would you do if you, you were you were prime minister or you were <laughs> transport secretary? What what would be your? Um, it's a tricky one, really, because you'd be tempted to think along the lines of compulsory lessons with an instructor um, and a minimum learning period. But I've taken pupils previously that. I would just be teaching them for teaching them sake on mm. minimum learning periods um, because I've had some, some cracking drivers or they've brought other experience to the table, whether it be through mopeds or whatever, that they would, they were just going to always go through it very, very quickly. Mm. Um, so I think we need to do something that I don't know, something maybe along the lines of graduated licensing, but nothing, that curtails the whole freedom of driving. And I think that's where the difficulty is, is that if you start sort of saying to people, you can't go out between certain times and you can't do this and you can't do that, it's too restrictive. It stops them doing the whole reason that they need to learn to drive. It can stop them from getting to work. Um, so there needs to be something where um, they've just got that little bit of reassessment going on or um, that further development after they pass the test so that the passing of the test isn't the the end of the road sort of idea and um, pass push used to be there before but it's it's not there anymore in the same way and um, we're very much relying on black boxes to bring about the the change and um, black boxes have done wonders in terms of controlling people's attitudes and the way they drive purely because of the force down it. Um, they've got to do it because they're going to have their insurance withdrawn or whatever. Um, do you think it has so been a positive, a, a positive thing? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do think black box. 
some of it has been. Um, some of it's very daft. Um, I've heard, the same with anyone else, the horror stories where they pop to a supermarket and they pull in the petrol station and then they drive into the, into the supermarket car park and that's been treated as two short journeys or whatever. Um, and therefore they end up getting penalised because they've taken a short journey when the reality is they haven't. They've, no. they've been they've been to uh, they've been to the, the petrol station and then they've gone in the supermarket. Um, it sounds like it depends on the software and the algorithms how how good that is really. Yes, yes, it does. Um, so I do think black boxes have done well. They've almost done the very thing that we needed from. Um, pass plus and, and other things is that do you think that's just from a young driver's perspective because obviously we, we work with fleets and um, we obviously see <laughs> black boxes used on fleet as well yeah um, it's a harder one with the experienced drivers because they feel big brothers watching them the moment that sort of thing happens um, whereas the young drivers they they've just got the licence they, they do understand or they've been told of their risks um, whereas the older drivers or the experienced drivers don't appreciate the reasons that they are there um, to two um, different situations um, when we look at fleet the company which has everything, they had telematics they had dash cams um, the whole hog, the driver training versus the one that was doing the driver training and they then brought in telematics um, it maybe wasn't communicated particularly effectively. Oh. Um, and they are the ones that had the most resistance to to the, the concept of telematics and black boxes. Um, so it, I don't see why they wouldn't, they couldn't do it. Um, I just, if you've got a choice of do I want insurance where there's a black box involved and or insurance where there isn't, People are going to go towards the one. Well, it it, it isn't. Uh, whether it's that fear of being caught out, um, I think people. If, if there was hundred pound difference, people would still pay that extra hundred pound. Yeah. Go for the one where they aren't going to have the black box in. Yeah. Um. I don't know. It, I think any enforcement is very very controversial. Um. It doesn't seem to gain any support. Yeah, there's the carrot and the stick though, as well, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because people don't think realize how much money we can save by the way way in which we drive, which doesn't necessarily need to be boring either. It can be quite um, sparky, quite enjoyable, quite you know uh, spirited drive, but still very more efficient and using less tires and less wear and tear on the vehicles. Yeah, and when we go out and do demo drives, people are genuinely surprised. I've done a drive before and. Um, and I've asked them afterwards, did I drive how you expected me to drive? Um, oh. No, no, I didn't expect you to do this, or um, I wasn't expecting you to do that, and I noticed that you did this, and that really caught me by surprise. Oh, um, oh I do some of that, but I, I didn't think it would be what you wanted me to be doing. I suppose it's expectations, isn't it? Because when we do fleet sessions, there's a lot around that where we have to break them expectations about. Yes. We feel like we can ask them to do all this, and yeah, and they are genuinely surprised when we don't do it, and um, and it's a little bit like straight lining and stuff like that that we bring into fleet, um, where it is literally assessed based on the risk, and and that be it. Um, and people are genuinely surprised by it when we go out and do it um, because they also expect a slow drive. Mm. Well, like, you're a driving instructor. I thought I was going to be, like, slow. Yeah. Well, it's a limit. <laughs> you still enjoy yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You can still have an amazing driving experience, but it's just getting to the limit and how you do it and, and what you do in between. So I made this my last question because it's getting late. Um, it's nearly past my bedtime. Uh, what what do you think you get the most enjoyment from either driving or training or both? What What's the thing that you really enjoy the most about it? Um, I do enjoy both. I love driving, um, but I also love the training side of it. I like... Um, I like helping with the training. 
Um, and particularly when you've got somebody that's very open-minded and a, and a guy I took out um, a couple of years ago, um, at the end of the session, he turned around and he said, I, I actually really enjoyed that. Um, he said, I wasn't totally expecting to sort of bring anything away. Um, and he said, and I noticed how you dealt with the people behind you. He said, and I thought I dealt with the people behind me really well. Oh. But he said, you were still able to show me that I could go that one step further and deal with them even better. So it's when you're able to demonstrate and show somebody how they can do, they are doing something really particularly well now, but just by tweaking it or making it slightly different, it can still be better or how they can get more enjoyment from their own driving. Because one of the things that people um, and, and trainees say when you go out is, I used to really like driving, but the roads are so much busier now. I just yeah. find it very, very much a chore. Um, and then we can look at how we can explore what can we do differently in those situations Right, what is it that you don't like? Well, I get stuck in queues, so how can we avoid being in a queue? What sort of things could you do differently there, whether it be journey times, different route, or just keeping space in front? Because one of the things that we notice when we are stuck in queues is that we aren't moving forward, where if you've constantly got that space and you don't stop, you don't recognise that, that same problem. It's a brain trip, um, really, isn't it? But, but it is so a brain many other trip. benefits to it as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, but likewise, when I'm out with my learners and teaching those to drive and some of the things that they actually learn and overcome themselves, um, particularly the younger, sort of the 17, the 18, 19-year-olds, um, they come along and they will beat themselves up that something might not be perfect um and i then talk to them and encourage them in about how actually we can do things a little bit wrong and it's just as important that we know how to fix something Absolutely. as getting it right perfectly the first time i taught a, a woman to drive and she passed early part of last year and um her learning to drive journey started 19 years ago oh, Lord. and she failed her first driving test because she bumped the curb during the parallel park and she asked the examiner which was quite brave at the time i, I yeah. guess can i redo that again and, and a lot of candidates when they take the test just won't have the nerve to ask that yeah. and he said yeah by all means give it another go and she went she pulled it back around she did it again and she made exactly the same mistake so whatever she did the first time she repeated it and did the second time and she failed and i took her for lessons and um She'd taken other tests on top of that that first one, but that was the one that really stayed with her. She went to test and she come back and I, I clambered into the back of my car um, to hear the result and the debrief. And um, the examiner's there, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that you've passed. And she shrieked, which was very, very high pitch. <laughs> um, and she turned around and she said... Um, I went and messed up my parallel park curve. I went and bumped the curb. She said, but I pulled it forward. And all the way, all she could say on the way home was, if I knew that I could pull it forward 19 years ago, I'd have been driving 19 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and I still do it with all my pupils now is just leave it alone. Let's see what goes wrong. Because what they then want to do is, is restart the whole thing again. And I say, we're doing parallel park. Do you really want to pull out and stop all the traffic again when you're doing this down a busy shopping street to try yeah. and get it in? What What's actually the problem with the car at the moment? What is stopping you switching it off, getting out, locking the doors and walking off? Well, the front end stuck out or whatever. Well, let's try and fix that bit then. And then they do it and suddenly it all makes sense and they start to recognise when it's going wrong how it's going wrong and then they they then actually learn that they can perfect it themselves on the first goes because they now know what caused it to go wrong in the first place so they're able to get that one step ahead so i do love that sort of thing and i love like looking at people's behaviors and things as well um and that doesn't matter who the driver is whether they're a new driver or a very experienced driver the things that they think about or where they look or what how their brain works when they're doing certain things 
Um, so I, I do love the training, but and the thing that brought me to being an instructor in the first place as well was that I actually really enjoy driving. Um, I like to think that I drive well and always aim to improve. And I've gone and stuff, done stuff more recently and sort of I've been on, on the receiving end of training and thought, I don't actually think I can do that. I don't like that um, because it, it's well out of my comfort zone. I'm in an area that I don't know. But then when I bring it home and I'll do it on roads that I am more familiar with and then I can actually assess and compare the difference between how I used to do it and what I'm doing now and how it's benefiting me and also the disadvantages of it as well. Mm. I, I can also see my own sort of learning cycle kicking into place um, that then obviously brings about change. Um, so is my driving the same as it was years ago? No, it, it most definitely probably isn't. Oh. Um, but it's it's constantly evolving, and um, and I'm still friends with the the lady actually that taught me to drive. Um, so it, I don't know. It's still a nerve wracking experience when she's in the car because she she is still my driving instructor. It doesn't matter that I do the same job as her. She's still my driving instructor, and I sort of sit here thinking, I bet she sat there thinking I didn't teach you to do that. Um, <laughs> So it's a bit it's a bit of a strange scenario to be fair. I think there's something important that you just said for me is about that whole coming up with a solution to fix something and it's okay to make an error or to make a mistake. That's where the learning is. That yeah. and that's about real life situations, isn't it? How would you deal with this in the real life? Because it's okay having a uh, one size fits all that's the solution but we that's not how it works you know there's going to be a, a curb that's at a different angle or your car's going to be longer or whatever for whatever reason it might be um we've got to deal with different scenarios and i think teaching people to or not teaching them to cock it up slightly but um being able to fix it um, and yeah. it's just as important because People lose their nerve the, the minute they feel they've lost control of the situation or it isn't going to plan. Um, so they get on test and something is not quite going how they want it to and panic kicks in. And they, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm good. they failed the test. The pen hasn't touched, or the, the dabber hasn't touched the iPad as it is now <laughs> to say that they failed that test. But in their mind, I failed that test because I've done this wrong. So it really is so important that they learn that to get it wrong almost uh -huh. so that they don't flap. They just do a fix and, and up, they get on with the, the drive. Otherwise, they do panic. And the number of people that I've had to come back and they've turned around and said, I felt sure I'd failed. Uh -huh. I felt sure I'd failed. I did this, I did that. Um, I, I was confident I'd failed. And there they are with a, a pass certificate and a, a big smiley grin. Uh -huh. Maybe maybe that's where the assessment should be is them being able to come up with a solution when it does go wrong. Maybe that's where the assessment needs to be placed because it's very uh, error fault orientated. Isn't it, it is. Yeah. Well, if you look at and consider sort of the developments, how um, we the DVSA moved away from check test over to standards checks, um, the driving test hasn't made that same move. Um, no. So, check tests very much relied on faults to occur, um, whereas the standard check is is competency based um, and graded. Um, and when you actually look down down that sheet, it's it isn't about driving. Nothing on that sheet mentions driving or anything like that. It's all about actually your competency to teach. Um, yes, that would be the one. Um, so why is the driving test not moved in the same way? Um, why are we not looking and thinking, well, that driver, no, they didn't handle that particularly well, but actually they then went on um, to, to resolve that issue. So actually, yes, there was a little bit of a fault in the old money, but it, it caused no danger because they did something else to compensate for it. And that's all about managing risk, which is what we should be doing on the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's what the the driving test at the moment doesn't do oh. it's like you've made a fault and, and that's it that's the end of it whereas if if it was about managing risk those skills are going to continue all the way along 
Well, we've solved all the problems now, haven't we? We have. I'll um, <laughs> I'll just I'll just submit my application for the CEO role at DVSA. <laughs> if I didn't Good think that somebody in the if I didn't think that somebody in the civil service didn't already have their name on it. Of course not. Um, but but of course you'd fix all the IT problems on the booking system first, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's not talk about the booking system. So subject. And, and of oh. course, the, the other bit is comms, isn't it? It doesn't take much, does it, to keep ADIs up to date and informed or the organisations informed. Look, we haven't got any information for you yet, but we appreciate the situation. Now, that's this all is what we're working on, or we understand this. Yeah, The communications have been so poor um, and then the, the blunders with the booking system have, have just been sort of people that had their driving tests on the first few days of that of the, the cancellations. But yet somebody who had a test in June got their email well before them. I just, I don't know. I can't make out what on earth is going on. All I can say is it obviously it wasn't built for that. It wasn't built to put things on pause. It wasn't built to do all this so i can appreciate it from that perspective but having another half that works in that engineering environment for mm. it it is possible so it's it's just having the right engineers in the right places think, to understand it i think when there's so many organizations businesses and everything else that have been able to leap and put things in place during these quite very difficult times um a, a a damn sight quicker than the DVSA have. Um, you're looking at companies and organisations that had everybody working from home a week after lockdown, and yet three, four months after um, after the beginning of lockdown, we've still got a DVSA that still don't know what what they're going to do with the booking system. Or oh. um, it's almost like they've sat on their hands, and then it's like, oh, we need the booking system to open, right? Um, yeah. How are we going to do that? Yeah. It's too late now. <laughs> uh, it's screwed. So we're screwed. Yeah, I I just don't know what's gone on there. Oh. Um, I'm, I just don't think that there'll be a, a lessons learned either. I think it's just well, it's happened. It won't happen again. Um, it was unprecedented, which just seems to be the catch-all excuse for everything. Um, but it shows, a, for me, it shows a lack of flexibility, a lack of ability to change, a lack of being able to read the situation and to deal with it, and and the rapid change that was required to deal with that. It just felt the communication. The communications doesn't need as much work as the booking system does, no. but they have failed on the communications. Um, we look at other organisations that are not got government bodies overarching them. If you look at the hair and beauty industry and those sort of things. There's no department of hair and beauty within government. Um, yet those organisations have probably been given more support and more guidance, more information um, from government than we were. Yet we have a whole agency dedicated to driver and vehicle standards. Mm. Yeah, there's also a disconnect between the politics of it because that happens in government and the DVSA um, operational element, I think, and I, I wonder whether there needs to be more joined up thinking there. Um, I think there's a, a consistency issue as well. Um, if we look at theory test certificates and the expiry of those, that's going to have a knock on effect for a lot of pupils. Um, and I think the cynic in me sort of says that is a way of the DVSA bringing in some extra money, it's a way of them artificially easing the demand on practical tests mm. because come the time when the booking system reopens, more pupils are going to have fallen foul that their theory certificate has now expired. Well, it's exacerbating they, the situation with the booking system, isn't it? And it's exacerbating the issue with theory tests because they aren't, it, they're not running at full capacity and able to fit demand there either, but that's run by a private provider and therefore it shifts the blame with that. But Northern um, Ireland, Northern Ireland have been able Northern to Ireland managed them. it, and the government turned around and said, we're not going to extend theory test certificates because of the impact of road safety. Sorry, road safety affects somebody whose theory certificate has expired that they take once in their whole lifetime of driving, 
but it, road safety is not affected when you extend MOT certificates for six months. Um, and likewise, driving licenses, you can drive on an expired photo card if you've got a full license for six or seven months because we've extended those, but the same doesn't apply for provisional. So again, it's another delay to somebody getting a test. So I think they've got this issue of delays on practical tests. So they're looking at things of, well, what can we put in that might delay somebody and try and bring those numbers down rather than actually thinking we need to do what we can for these people because ultimately there's a financial cost for those that are taking the theory test certificates and stuff as well. I've just worked out the solution. We need to give DVSA a standards check so that they can come up with their own <laughs> solutions to their own problems. I think there are too many with the fingers in their ears. <laughs> um, I, I still got respect for DVSA because, you know, they've still got a challenging job and I'm sure it's been difficult, but um, I think it lacked leadership and it lacked communication, didn't it? Um, I th yeah, I think up until coronavirus, I, I've got no problem with who the DVSA are or what they do. I don't have a problem with standard checks. So when people turn around, they're like, oh, I feel that DVSA poke their nose in, just leave me to my job. I've got no problem that they come along and they give me a standards check because I signed up to the job. I knew that was part of the job. I've got no problem with it. And the two examiners that I've had give some very good feedback. They also um, are very open to discussion. Prior to coronavirus, I thought the DVSA had made a massive shift from the way that the DSA worked oh. in terms of their communications and the information and things that they sent out coronavirus hit and just all of their hard work from those last few years just seems to have gone down the drain I mean we've got our test centre manager and um, that guy is brilliant I could pick up the phone to him um, and likewise he'll pick up the phone to me to, um, to let me know something so that I can circulate it on um, and he is absolutely spot on and we never had that when it was the days of the DVSA oh. um, so partially on a local point of view he has done so much work for their communications but the national DVSA have, have sort of scuppered a lot of the, their hard work oh. um, of communicating out with the industry over the last few years because I really did think that they were getting somewhere they lost that us and them feel that there was many, many years ago. But then they brought it back in, in the lack of comms to instructors. Hmm. Well, as I say, we put the world to right. So uh, is there anything else? No, not that I can think of. <laughs> I think we've pretty much, um, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thanks very much for Kev. Uh, we had great fun uh, having a chat with this one. Uh, take care. Thank you very much.